Chapter 10, An Unchanging God Most man-made Bible teaching systems have one commonality. They consistently fail to account for the major differences between church age and non-church age teachings. This disregard for God's explicit instructions has produced several generations of disillusioned believers and skeptical non-believers. Unfortunately, many of the teachers who disregard such distinctions are quite popular and associated with mainstream religions. In many cases, their impact has produced some seemingly irreversible damage. In fact, the mishandling of God's Word by those refusing to rightly divide it, has adversely affected God's work in several ways. Man cannot possibly obey the seemingly contradictory aspects of the Bible. In fact, the philosophy of everything in the Bible applies equally to all throughout the last 6,000 years makes God's Word appear inaccurate, inconsistent, and inadequate. The failure to understand God's method of Bible study is the primary reason that Bible-rejecting Bible colleges and seminaries have notoriously been graduating scripturally inept students who become blind leaders of the blind, Matthew 15, 14. On the other hand, true Bible believers know and believe that the Bible is the Word of God containing the very words of the Almighty God. As such, the Creator has the right to tell man how to correctly study and correctly apply His Word in every age. Additionally, all haphazard approaches employed by man simply do not glorify God. Neither do any of the systematically inaccurate theological study systems. They create the confusion that is so evident today. The Bible says that God is not the author of this confusion. 1 Corinthians 14.33 for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Only when we study the Bible God's way does the resultant clarity trump the man-induced, Satan-inspired confusion. This is because the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Most people have very little confidence in ever understanding the word of God. To them, the Bible remains and will remain a closed book never to be understood. This spiritual darkness is understandable since the entrance of God's words into a person's life gives that individual the necessary light and understanding to see God's truths. Additionally, the extent of one's understanding of God's word does not come through higher education or a person's intelligence or by any other man-centric means. Herein lies one of the greatest quandaries. As man chooses to ignore God's method of Bible study, he grows increasingly confused. This confusion and the resultant lack of understanding cause him to dismiss any true hope of knowing God or His Word. The Apostle Paul made a bold proclamation, knowing how to understand all things, when he wrote how to understand all things. 2 Timothy 2.7 Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. Within the context of that proclamation, also found later in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul would write something that would serve as the key to understanding everything else that God said to man. The key is quite simple. Consider what he says and study the Bible the way he tells us to do so. These two truths serve to unlock all other truth. Eight verses later, the Apostle Paul further admonished the believer what to consider. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, and it goes on, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible assures that rightly dividing the word of truth provides understanding in all things, 2 Timothy 2.7. People do not understand the Bible because they fail to rightly divide it, meaning they fail to study it God's way. God's Bible study method gives light concerning his expectations in future dispensations, clarifies his teaching for prior dispensations, and thankfully pinpoints the truths for this present dispensation. This is what is most important for us. God's method of Bible study specifically identifies his expectations for us today. These expectations differ throughout time for two primary reasons. Number one, God deals differently with distinctive people groups. And number two, God's dealings with man change through time and circumstances. God's unchanging character. We now explore a few pertinent examples of how 
Proper Bible study reconciles and clarifies differences found within Scripture. First, we must consider a common misconception of dispensationalism perpetrated by those following some of the man-made theological systems. Because the critics of dispensational Bible study do not understand God's method of study, they claim that it actually promotes some type of changing God. Nothing could be further from the truth. These teachers misinterpret verses such as Malachi 3.6 and Hebrews 13.8 to ignorantly dismiss the necessity for proper Bible divisions. The Bible testifies that God never has, never will, and never can change. Malachi 3.6 For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Simply put, the Lord does not change. So how do these verses apply? Do they indicate that God is always and will always deal with mankind without variation? Or do these verses in fact reveal that God himself has always and will always remain unchanging? The false line of thinking suggests that God always does the same thing. His work is unchanging. The correct way of understanding these truths reveals that God is always the same. His person and character remain unchanging throughout eternity. Most Bible teachers fail to recognize God's purpose for the truths conveyed in these verses, along with many other similar passages. Simply put, these truths refer to God's unchanging character rather than God's plan for man. It is imperative to understand that God's character never changes, but His message to mankind certainly has changed and certainly will change through time. Those who refuse to distinguish between God's varying messages and God's unchanging character remain confused and bewildered. The fact that God deals differently with man throughout history remains an indisputable truth. The scripture repeatedly points to this fact in verses like the following. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Combining this truth from Hebrews with the earlier verses from Malachi chapter 3 and Hebrews chapter 13 proves the foundational teaching of dispensationalism. God never changes, but he has at sundry times spoken to man in diverse manners. No Bible believer would argue with the fact that God has spoken to man at various times in a variety of ways. These message variations take place through two primary means. Number one, an outright change in message. And number two, God providing additional insight into previously given truths. Either way, God's message may change, but God's character remains constant. The message is changed. Bible critics, along with the more extreme Bible agnostics love to emphasize the perceived contradictions in Scripture. They assume that God's differing requirements somehow discredit the authenticity and accuracy of the inspired text. They know that the authority of God's Word is predicated on the issue of infallibility. Their goal is to discredit the Bible so they can discredit God. If they can discredit God, they excuse themselves from submission to his rule and become a god unto themselves. Fortunately for mankind, the critics and agnostics are wrong on several fronts. First, Scripture is completely free from any contradiction when rightly divided. Second, variations in messages serve to confirm the continuity of Scripture. As students of God's Word, we must locate and understand the answers for these variations and so-called contradictions. We should always be ready to give an answer to those inquiring concerning the truth. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Before seeking the solution to any of the Bible's apparent contradictions, one must first acknowledge that differences in messages exist within Scripture. Consider the following messages along with their corresponding variations. Number one, dieting restrictions. God, speaking to Adam, limited his diet to herbs and trees. Genesis 1.29 I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat. God speaking to Noah, extended man's diet to now include animals along with the herbs and trees. 
Genesis 9, 2. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. God speaking to Moses placed specific dietary restrictions upon the Jewish nation. Leviticus 11.4 Nevertheless, these shall ye eat not of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof. As the camel, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the coney, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the hare, because he cheweth the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. And the swine, though he divide the hoof, and be cloven-footed, yet he cheweth not the cud, he is unclean to you. Of their flesh shall ye not eat, and their carcass shall ye not touch. They are unclean to you. Now God speaking to Timothy through the Apostle Paul removed the restrictions under the law during the church age and referred to any restriction as a doctrine of devils. First Timothy 4, one continues in there, and it says, In the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Verse 3 tells what these doctrines of devils are. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. The chart on page 160 is titled Dietary Restrictions. This first example concerning the changing dietary laws should sufficiently pique a person's interest concerning how God's requirements vary according to his will. Although these few verses prove the point, many more passages exist offering additional evidence. The examples that follow prove that the dietary laws are not simply an anomaly to dismiss as an exception to the rule, but are indicative of God's changing decrees. Number two the Sabbath observance. God speaking to Moses commanded him to express his commands to Israel concerning their keeping the Sabbath. Exodus 31.12 And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbath ye shall keep. Verse 14 Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defile it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death. God speaking to the Colossians through the Apostle Paul expressed God's changes concerning the Sabbath during the church age. Colossians 2.16 reads thus, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. This single verse, along with many additional ones, reveals Paul's instructions to the church concerning dietary laws, holy days, and Sabbaths. It clearly expresses how drastically God's instructions change following the cross. In fact, Colossians 2.14 points out that these Old Testament ordinances were nailed to Christ's cross. Therefore, no man during the church age is to judge someone for not following the Old Testament ordinances. The chart on page 161 is titled, Sabbath Observance. Number three, responsibility in evangelism. God speaking to the twelve apostles in Matthew chapter 10 instructed them to go only to the Jews and directed them away from the Gentiles. Matthew 10.5, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God speaking to the eleven remaining apostles through his son immediately following his death told them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16.15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God speaking to the Jews informed them that Paul first spoke to them but would turn to the Gentiles. Acts 13.46, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. The chart on page 162 is titled, Go to the Gentiles. 
The twelve were commanded not to go to the Gentiles, whereas Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11.13. The book of Acts records how he traveled to various cities, entered the synagogues, and witnessed the Jews blaspheme and reject his message, Acts 18, verses 5 and 6. In each case, he then turned to the Gentiles with a final turning point recorded in the final chapter of Acts, Acts 28.28. 28. These few examples reveal that God told his followers not to go to the Gentiles with the kingdom of heaven in Matthew chapter 10, and then called Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11.13, and a teacher of the Gentiles, 1 Timothy 2.7, 2 Timothy 1.11. Footnote number one. After the cross, the book of Acts records that others ministered to the Gentiles before Paul. Both Philip and Peter were compelled to go to the Gentiles. Philip was told to go to a desert place, Acts 8, 26-29, to an Ethiopian who was evidently a Gentile proselyte to Judaism. It is believed that Philip was a man of Jewish descent who grew up in a Gentile culture. That's McLaurin. Philip was one of the seven chosen in Acts chapter 6. He did come from Samaria, where a great revival had taken place probably because of Jesus talking with a woman at the well and staying in Samaria for two days. At that point, many of their hearts were prepared. Additionally, Peter resisted going to the Gentiles until God taught him the lesson of Acts chapter 10. That lesson was used in Acts chapter 15 when he realized that the message was for Gentiles as well as the Jews. At that point, we know that Peter fully supported the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. Yet Peter struggled when faced with the believers from Jerusalem, who were still making Jewish proselytes of the saved Gentiles, Galatians 2.14. He simply failed to understand fully the evangelization of the Gentiles like Paul, at least until he penned 1 Peter, as also witnessed by his remarks at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15. The commands in Matthew are time-sensitive. No Bible believer denies these distinctions, and every diligent Bible student understands their divine purpose. Dispensationalism will, as we shall see, explain how and why these differences exist. Interestingly, one need not wait until after the Apostle Paul's calling into ministry to recognize a shift in emphasis toward Gentile evangelism. Even in Jesus' day in ministry, Luke 2, verse 32. Christ forbade his apostles to go to the Gentiles in Matthew chapter 10, yet Israel proceeded to reject Christ's Messiahship. Seemingly without explanation, two chapters later, Matthew chapter 12, one reads of the inclusivity of the Gentiles. Matthew 12:18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. What had changed between Matthew chapters 10 and 12? This is a vitally important concept, and one that most dispensationalists have missed. The Jewish nation knew that the prophecies foretold that Elijah would precede the coming Messiah. So they could not understand how Christ could claim to be their Messiah if Elijah had not first come as Christ's messenger. Matthew chapter 11 solves that conundrum. Jesus pointed to John the Baptist as the prophesied forerunner. He was Elijah in spirit. Matthew 11.10 For this he, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. As the narrative continues in Matthew chapter 11, we read that national Israel, those alive in Jesus' day, rejected their Messiah and the forerunner sent by him. 
Thus, we see the Gentiles' inclusion in Matthew chapter 12 and the kingdom message taking on a mystery form using parables in Matthew chapter 13. When the apostles noticed this shift, they questioned Jesus why he began to speak to the multitudes in parables, and here was his answer. Matthew 13:13. 13, 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Israel was choosing blindness over revelations. They blasphemously attributed the works of John to the devil, Matthew 11:18, and Christ's works to Beelzebub, Matthew 12:24. As this study reveals, there are clearly times when God's message and his expectations change from one period to the next. In other instances, it is not so much that the message changed, but that God instructed his messenger to provide new or additional light to something previously given. In these instances, the initial command remained intact to be observed. But now the command must be followed in relation to the additional information provided. As we will see, the new additional information in no way usurps the old, but simply adds God's new direction and insights. Number four, revelation added. Sometimes things change dispensationally when the information is added to an existing doctrine or practice. This feature occurs far too frequently to exhaustively address in this work. A few simple examples should establish the precedent and confirm God's method of conveying truth in this fashion. Matthew chapter 5 frequently incorporates this Bible teaching practice, so attention will be directly focused upon this section. Interestingly, Jesus' teaching generally incorporated one of the most effective teaching tools. He often transitioned people from what they knew to what they did not know. The following examples point out that Jesus began with a statement concerning the old or known, like, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, and then moved on to the new. The first one, Jesus addressing anger. Matthew 5.21, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. And here's the old time statement. Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. After declaring the Old Testament decrees familiar to his audience, Jesus added new information with words like the following. Matthew 5.22, But I say unto you that, and then here's the new, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Here's the second one. Jesus addressing adultery. Matthew 5.27 Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. So here's what was said. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Matthew 5.28 But I say unto you that, and then here's the new, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. The third one is Jesus addressing divorce. Matthew 5.31 It hath been said, and here's what was said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Matthew 5.32, the next verse. But I say unto you that, and then here's the new, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. The next one, Jesus addressing vengeance. Matthew 5.38, ye have heard that it hath been said, the old, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Matthew 5.39, But I say unto you that, here's the new, ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. Since the time that Jesus expressed these teachings, teachers have misunderstood them. Yet the two most common misconceptions are as follows. The differences demonstrate contradictions within the Bible, and changes from old to new decrease the believer's spiritual responsibilities. The truth lies the opposite end of the spectrum. In these instances, the changes instituted by Christ added a more stringent requirement upon the listeners to an already strict law. Christ was certainly not contradicting the law, nor was he doing away with the law. He was adding clarity, detail, and further explanation to what the law said. Think about it. The law said adultery was wrong. But Jesus told his audience that if the heart was already working through the act, the person was guilty as though he had committed the very act. The Jews who received these instructions were now responsible for these added dimensions of truth. 
Herein lies the dilemma for someone desires to serve God in spirit and in truth. Where do we go to find God's will and expectations during the church age? What message do we obey? Are we to feel guilty if we cannot simultaneously obey the entire Bible? Are we to obey the message given under the law to the Jews? Are we accountable for the teaching concerning the kingdom found in the four Gospels? Are we only responsible for adherence to the message found in the church age epistles? How do we reconcile matters if these messages contain conflicting information? Why distinct messages? No honest Bible teacher student denies the presence of distinct messages within Scripture. In fact, four specific details make each message distinguishable. Number one, the manner of delivery, e.g., signs, visions, dreams, preaching, or teaching. Number two, the person delivering the message, e.g., prophet, priest, apostle, or preacher. Number three, the audience receiving the message, e.g., an individual or people group, Jews, Gentiles, or the Church of God. And number four, the message's content. Throughout history, additional features also play a role in message variation. For instance, one of the most important elements concerns a message's relationship to the timing of the cross. Many things prior to the cross fail to remain constant following the cross. Those who fail to consider this aspect find the Bible remains a closed book to them. The final dwelling place of God's people is one good example of something that changed in relation to the cross of Christ. Paul testified of a man who was caught up to paradise located in the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12.2 I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. According to this passage, paradise is located up in the third heaven. Yet while Jesus hung on the cross, he told the repentant thief that they would be together in paradise on the very day of the crucifixion. Luke 23, verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. If at that time paradise was up in the third heaven, how could the Bible be true since Jesus said he would spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth? Matthew 12, verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The change in location concerning paradise, along with other important Bible truths, shows distinctions in truth in relation to the cross and resurrection. Prior to Christ's crucifixion, paradise, or Abraham's bosom, Luke 16.22, was in the heart of the earth. Following Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, it is now located in the third heaven. Those who fail to account for things being different before and after the cross remain confused and bewildered. Questions to be answered. One of the most effective means for ascertaining the why of varying Bible messages is to ask and answer some pertinent questions. To what people group was God speaking? What were the prevailing circumstances that existed when the message was first delivered? If the message points to a future fulfillment, what prevailing or unique circumstances will exist when the message will be implemented or fulfilled? Where does this message fall time-wise in relation to the cross of Christ? In order to demonstrate how useful a role the answers to these questions play, consider a distinction in message concerning vengeance. According to the Old Testament law, the Jews were to respond with a spirit of vengeance, an eye for an eye, Matthew 5.38. The Lord Jesus changed this when he said that whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, Matthew 5.39. Yet again, Paul told the Romans that believers are to live peaceably with all men with the caveat, if it be possible, Romans 12.18. So do we take our vengeance in the form of an eye for an eye, turn the cheek, or realize that there are times when it will not be possible to peaceably coexist with some people? The chart on page 169 is titled, Vengeance. This comparison reveals God's instructions to and for the Christian living during the church age without ignoring or spiritualizing the other teachings. In other words, each passage must be believed and interpreted in a literal context depending upon its specific and time-sensitive application. 
The first instruction, period, discussed, covers the period of time under the law in Exodus chapter 21. Here's the law, Exodus 21, 23. And if any mischief followed, and thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. In the previous chapter, Exodus chapter 20, God gave the Ten Commandments to the Jews. The law clearly prescribed the punishment associated with each sin. The law required not only the punishment of an eye for an eye, but also life for life. The death penalty was also imposed for many other infractions under the law. One could be stoned to death under the law for gathering sticks on the Sabbath, Numbers 15, 32 through 36. Blasphemy, Leviticus 24, 11 through 14. Serving other gods, Deuteronomy 13, 6 through 10. Being a disobedient, unrepentant child, Deuteronomy 21, 18 through 21. One need only imagine, for a moment, the sharp decline in the average life expectancy in the United States and around the world if God imposed the same penalties for the same infractions on everyone today. The Lord Jesus Christ, during his earthly ministry, addressed the same passage but presented a variation in this message. Here's from the Gospels in Matthew 5.38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. The example from Matthew chapter 5 above shows the Lord quoting the law, as given in Exodus chapter 21. In this case, the people group really did not change that much, but the timing certainly did. Christ was still speaking to Jews, but this time he was clearly teaching concerning the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, 3, 5, 10, 5, 19, and 20. The full ramifications of this change are considerable. The Lord changed the response from one of returning punishment equal to the offense to opening oneself up to additional mistreatment by turning the other cheek. Obviously, these two responses to an act or sin, an eye for an eye versus turning the cheek, are in no way identical, nor are they compatible. The Lord Jesus Christ preached kingdom doctrine, giving the rule of law that will be in effect during his future kingdom. The Lord's response to Pilate shows that the Lord's kingdom was not now on earth, but would be later. Jesus said, Now is my kingdom not from hence, John 18.36. Under the Old Testament law, church, or the Jewish religion, was married to the state or government, both being governed by the law of Moses. Therefore, the law of Moses not only determined what was right and what was wrong, but likewise executed the appropriate judgment for wrongdoing. During the future kingdom, church and state will once again be married together, both under the rule of King Jesus. He will not only determine what is right and what is wrong, but will likewise impose the appropriate punishment for wrongdoing. These two time periods under the law, Exodus, and in the kingdom, delineated in Matthew, vary greatly from Paul's definitive writings to the church. Paul's instructions give us the guiding principle today. Do you take an eye for an eye? Do you turn the cheek? Or do you follow Paul? Paul said, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. So if Paul has the authority to tell us to follow him, we should consider what his epistles say to us. Church, Romans 12, 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. We are no longer authorized or even permitted to take an eye for an eye. Although capital punishment remains a scriptural practice, see Romans 1.32. Every Christian is to attempt to live peaceably with all others. In fact, we are to strive to live peaceably, but with the caveat, if it be possible. Meaning that we are also not required to turn the cheek each time. Putting it simply, do not apply the law to your relationship. Turn the cheek if you can. But in this sin-sick world, you are not obligated to turn the cheek in every instance. For this reason, it is safe to say that God allows for self-defense during the church age. 
So why the difference in message from that given in Romans and the one found in Matthew? One might suggest that our message differs because of its relative relationship to the cross, but in many ways the future implementation of the kingdom message will occur after the cross and after Daniel's 70th week. In this case, and many others, the audiences receiving the message vary along with a specific application of the messages to those audiences. One of the greatest differences appears to be the divorce of church and state during the church age. During the church age, the law of Moses is not the authoritative law book determining the fate of men. But neither is King Jesus seated on a throne in Jerusalem demanding instantaneous consequences for law breaking. He simply is not yet seated there. By no means does this give Christians in the New Testament church license to do as they please. The Bible says that each of us is to attempt to live peaceably with all others using the power that lies within us, God's Spirit. Every Christian is to pray for kings and for all that are in authority that he, the Christian, may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. In fact, in doing so, the Christian is praying for the minister of God or rulers because they are the bearers of the sword of wrath in the church age. Romans 13, 1 through 6. Some of the most dangerous religious political groups over the last 2,000 years have been those who claimed the name of Christ and took it upon themselves to bear the governing sword of authority. Although the sword is still active, capital punishment, it is not to be wielded by the hands of the church. Most Bible teachers would agree that it would be wrong to bind Christians to the Old Testament principle that gives them a responsibility to take an eye for an eye. However, fewer consider that it would be equally wrong in this sin sick world to require that everyone turn the cheek. God allows things today that he will not permit when he is ruling as king of kings, Revelation 17, 14, Revelation 19, verses 15 and 16. When King Jesus sits on the throne, turning the cheek will be easy and quickly rewarded. We need to rightly divide the Bible to know and obey the commands God has given to us. Realizing that God does not always require a Christian to turn the cheek may encourage some readers to conclude that they may do as they please. This conclusion is flawed unless what pleases you is pleasing to the Lord. When you are willing to take the wrong done against you, 1 Corinthians 6, 7, you reflect a higher level of spiritual maturity. People who lack spiritual maturity will frequently respond in a carnal, vengeful way to those who have wronged them. This is never right. Those who live trusting that God can and will take care of them will have a greater desire to live peaceably with others. Where do we go? As has been previously stated, it is imperative that we know where to find God's message to us. Finding God's message to us does not imply that we ignore the remaining parts of Scripture, but that we accurately understand God's expectations for us. For the church-age saint, we find our primary mail in the church-age epistles, Romans through Jude. In most cases, our primary spokesman is the Apostle Paul, who wrote the majority of these epistles directly to and for us. When messages conflict or differ, we should read our mail to find what our apostle or apostles said to us. We should consider whether the message is altogether different, or if we are merely receiving additional light that serves as a companion to the light previously given. It is not safe to assume that everything under the Old Testament law is null and void, nor is it safe to assume that all of it is binding upon those living today. We know what God wants us to do by considering what Paul said, 2 Timothy 2.7, and by rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. God never intended for men to be confused. Chapter.